And now, coming to you live from Huntsville Athletic Studios, it's Pop Culture Philosophers. And here are your hosts, Rockin' Robbie Billups and John Hammertime Horseshoe. Hey everybody, it's Pop Culture Philosophers, coming to you always live from the Huntsville Attic. And today I'm very excited, we're going to talk about 70s movies, that's right, films from the 70s, we're talking about directors, actors, uh, big blockbuster films, uh, everything about the 70s. I'm excited, uh, we have a good show for you, we got a great, great group of guys here to talk about the 70s, and uh, I'm, of course, John Hammertime Holshu, with me always, is Rockin' Robbie Billups. Hey everybody, I am Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's a pleasure to be here in the Huntsville Attic to talk to you guys about 70s movies with my homie Hammertime Holshu. And some great guests that we have tonight, everybody. We got, of course, with us, as usual, Justin Goldsmith. Hey, how's it going? Uh, it's going great, man. Going great. Sweet. Happy to be here. Yeah. Absolutely. Also, haven't heard from him since the Heist Movies podcast, but it is Timothy Gorman, everybody. How's it going, everybody? Happy 2017. He's yeah, alive. Happy, happy 2017. He's alive. This is the first episode of 2017, so it happy is. new year. We hope this this new year brings you lots of joy Success and opportunity, right? Yeah, we hope that nobody hits anybody with a car or gets in a comic shop. <laughs> or that, yeah. <laughs> very um, specific. Very specific. Do you have any specific? For those of you that don't know, Robbie works at the Deep Comics <clears throat> and Games in Huntsville, Alabama, and it was recently uh, renovated Yeah. by a vehicle. Yeah. By a mm-hmm. Honda. Just look <laughs> they up made com- it into a parking yeah, lot. Yeah, look up SUV comic shop. You'll find it. Anyway, so we're talking about 70s movies. So, Justin, to you, what defines movies from the 70s? Like, we're, doing, we're, we're singling out that one decade. Why? What makes the 70s in film, what makes it unique? I, I think that the 70s, to me anyway, can be summed up in one word, and it's cool. Everything in the 70s was cool as shit. Okay. But, like, you got, there's so many muscle car movies and these cool, like, gangster movies, and there's... All different genres, and for some reason, they all seem to be just cooler than, okay. the, than the ones made in other decades. Like, especially uh, Steve McQueen was more in the '60s, I guess, than the '70s. But yeah, like those kind of movies where you got all these car chases and you, uh, muscle cars, I guess, is a big theme. Absolutely, Timothy. What do you what what to you defines movies in the '70s? I think the the, the, the definitive question is how many movies and icons can you think of how many different character actors came from that def- uh decade uh there's just a list of just different actors that all started around 1970 and then just has been decade after decade they've been here they've started out and you can see them age and develop themselves because of of the way that they've been on on the movie screen. I can't really want to talk about it yet because that's where I get excited for. Oh, absolutely. Okay, yeah. I totally get what you're saying, though. There's a lot of careers that got started in the 70s. Lots of very important names that got that got their start in the 70s and, and changed film. And I think that's a big deal about the 70s. I really think the 70s is one of the most industry-changing decades of film. Pretty much, like John, what do you think? Like, what defines seventies? Why are we doing this podcast? We're doing this. Seventies was was a, was a pretty big part of of Hollywood. The tail end of the sixties, early seventies, Hollywood took a, a financial dip. It was on a decline. Um, artistically, it was on a decline, and so Hollywood uh, came back in a big way with the summer blockbuster, which we'll get to. But Hollywood had to kind of transform itself and get more. You have to take risk. Unfortunately, after Cleopatra, years before that, but after Cleopatra, you know, look how much it cost to, to make. And they learned a lot from from previous experience, and they took a different approach in the seventies. But the seventies, to me, I always think of of cops fil- cop films like Dirty Harry, and I think of James Bond. For some reason, the seventies, those are the films that come to mind automatically. Oh yeah, yeah. okay, I, I agree with pretty much what everybody said here. You know, one thing for sure, of course, is the blockbuster thing. You know, and, and what John said was Hollywood was in dire straits by the end of the 60s. And at the end of the 60s, they started making more movies towards youth. 
Oh yeah, it's definitely geared towards the younger yeah, audience. The graduate. They, they made start, them cooler. Yeah, they made them cooler, and they they also started doing more like political films. Yes, I sense that. And thing. yeah, more like like more mature themes, maybe like. But but basically, the filmmakers and the films themselves were way more daring. They really like a lot of restrictions on things like language and violence were being loosened up, and they were really exploring a lot of new territory. But to me, like straight up, Cinescope. You know, you're like one of the things that made movies super cool to me was like Cinescope, and I know that that was before, mm. but almost every movie started adapting that towards the 70s, maybe, and <laughs> zooming. <laughs> like, there's a <laughs> lot of zooming yeah. in 70s movies, and that's one fad in the industry from the 70s that I'm glad died away because the zoom is kind of a terrible thing. But there's a lot of zooming in the 70s. You guys know what I'm talking. It's all about, about prime lenses now. <laughs> yeah. So Timothy earlier was actually getting kind of antsy because he wanted to talk about some of these great actors that came out of the 70s that either evolved from the 70s, introduced in the 70s, or and there's, some, there's also a couple actors, uh, well, a handful that were prominent through the 70s. I mean, every other year, this you know certain actors would be portrayed um, on the big screen. Uh, so I'd like to talk, start with you, Timothy. Tart with you? <laughs> I'd like to tart. <laughs> I'd like to tart with yeah, you. Yeah, that sounds a weird thing. Well, I'm going to tart with Timothy. I'll meet you guys in 10 minutes. <laughs> no, let's let's start with you. Let's talk about the actors in the 70s that you feel were were big prominent actors or you think came out of the 70s and changed, uh, changed film. Well, I know that um, it started in 1969, I believe. That was with Easy Rider. There happened to be a very young, handsome man named Jack Nicholson. Um, Jack Nicholson is one of my all-time favorite uh, character actors. Uh, I, I think a lot of people nowadays hone to the characteristics of what Jack Nicholson, he can have um, serious moments. He can also uh, engage and, and express his feelings very well. Uh, th- throw his weight around, basically. But yeah, guys like DiCaprio, guys like... I don't know, Matt Damon, um, they, they all come from him. Jack Nicholson was great. Uh, I liked him in Chinatown myself. I thought that was uh, extremely gritty and a great police detective drama. It's a very oh, yeah. good movie, yeah. And he gets his nose fucked up? Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, I do also, uh, I like a young Dustin Hoffman. Because uh, after, oh, yeah. after The Graduate. Oh, yeah, The Graduate. Yeah, which launched his career, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know of him. Bef- he may have met himself before that. I, no offense to that's That's what I know him from. Right. I actually knew him, uh, seen a few different uh, Kramer versus Kramer, All the President's Men. Oh, yeah. Um, what all- year is Tootsie? Tootsie's in the 80s, I believe. Okay. Yeah, but no. All was, the cross-dressing didn't happen until the 80s. Sorry. Little, little Big Man was in the 70s, right? Yes, That's sir. That's a fantastic movie with Dustin Hoffman. It was fantastic. very underrated, and, and nobody really puts him on the on yeah, definitive it's, it's, charts If you that. guys have never watched Little Big Man starring Dustin Hoffman, oh my goodness, watch it. But um, I do like those guys. And then, obviously, I mean, if you were talking about gangster films and gangster roles, uh, Al Pacino, Robert De Niro... Um, Marlon Brando, all of those iconic, um, son, uh, the Corleones, that, that's all that yeah, they right. were. All the Corleones. <laughs> so. Goldsmith, you're an actor yourself. Uh, were there some actors in the 70s that you are fond of or that maybe influenced your career? Uh, well, it hasn't been mentioned yet, but uh, one of my main influences actually started in the 70s with a little film called Star Wars, Harrison Ford. I mean, yeah, you got De Niro and Pacino, Brando, Hoffman. Like, there were so many good actors uh, in the 70s that were active then, and most of them were just getting their start that are, we've been talking about. Harrison Ford's one of them, and he, he'd he probably be my favorite out of the group that we've been talking about. But then you still got, like, Gene Wilder was in so many movies in the 70s. Oh, yeah, I love Gene Wilder. John Travolta, nobody mentioned. Yeah, John Travolta, for sure. Burt yeah. Reynolds. <laughs> yeah, man. Those are some of the most popular actors of the 70s, are Travolta and Reynolds, for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, and for oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Robbie, did you have anything you wanted to talk about? Well, yeah, I got a couple. Uh, first of all, Justin mentioned Gene Wilder. He's yeah. one yeah. of mine. Like, all those movies of his in the 70s, and we got to think about those those Mel Brooks films, like Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein. Yeah. We, we got... The movies he did with uh, Richard Pryor started in the seventies, right? Yeah, plus yes. the Willy Wonka movie yeah, was and in the seventies. Willy 70s. Wonka, exactly. That's why I was gonna, uh, Gene Wilder's great. 
right along with Gene Wilder, Madeline Kahn, oh, who yeah. is also oh, yeah. in a ton of those Mel Brooks movies. Yeah. Uh, Diane Keaton. Oh yeah! Oh my goodness! From Annie Hall, and of course the Godfather. Yeah, film. she's right. a Godfather. She's so yeah. good. Well, because of the Woody Allen films, definitely. In pati- yeah, that and but jumped. the Godfather too. I yes. mean I mean she does a great job. The Godfather, or the Godfather too. The Godfather and the Godfather too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think she's actually better in Godfather too, in my opinion. But agree to disagree. I, I think she has a bigger role. Does she, <laughs> doesn't she have a bigger role? In yeah, part definitely. Two? Uh, but straight up, the one actor that I would pick would be Robert De Niro. Like, yeah. I, I think Bobby De Niro defined... I mean, Godfather 2, he plays a young Vito, yeah. right? And you got Taxi Driver. Taxi Driver was oh, a And all deal. those Scorsese yeah. films. New York, New York, which I love, and Mean Streets. Like, I just... Robert De Niro, I think, owned the 70s, man. I, See, need, to, I need to clarify. I picked my favorite from the 70s. I don't necessarily think his work in the 70s was better than, you know, say, De Niro or Pacino or anybody. Well, I picked my, my, yeah. my, my favorite, too. That's Robert okay. De Niro. yeah. I, I picked the right answer. You, no, it is. I'm just kidding. He's one of yeah. The, no, yeah. we're talking about He's favorites there. always. Yeah. That's, it's, yeah. On top what of about that. you, John? Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, yeah. On top of what you mentioned, yeah, you talked about De Niro. You talked about uh, Gene Wilder, which I I, I dearly love. Um, we've talked about Burt Reynolds. Uh, I was gonna mention Clint Eastwood, who who oh. not only mm-hmm. I mean, this is after the uh, Man with No Name. That's that's pre 70s, but the 70s got the dirty. That's Harry called films. the 60s. Yeah, I'm saying. <laughs> but 70s got the Dirty Harry films. He does additional cowboy films in addition to that. He kept doing cowboy films. But of course... Outlaw Josie Wales. Yeah, a great yeah. film. Award-winning film. I love that movie. And uh, his direct- directorial debut, actually. And uh, and then, of course, Dirty Harry, which is about how I, I knew him as. You know what I'm saying? I didn't see those Western movies when I was a kid. I wasn't a fan of spaghetti Westerns. Mm. Uh, as I got older, I started really liking them. And, you know, it, it evolved. But as a kid, he was Dirty Harry, man. He had that revolver. That Smith and Wesson, he was just such a badass. I, but again, that would define the seventies for me because of that 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 crap, those terrible cars, and that crappy hairstyle. <laughs> I was always wondering about Eastwood and his uh, supporting actors. What the uh, monkey? Yeah, the ora- <laughs> no, the orangutan. Oh my sir. bad, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Any which way, which but loose, I think is what. Had and then the, the other one, yeah. yeah. Every it, which spawned, way, but in or something. I don't it know. It spawned a sequel. A sequel? <laughs> yeah, it's every which way, but loose, and then. Which it way works. you can, or something like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, <Electric> boogaloo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they could have threw in anyone, but they decided to have a monkey. So at some point in time, you have to an orangutan. Oh yeah. yes. <laughs> at, at some point in time in your career, you either get a little kid sidekick or you get a monkey sidekick. Yes. Even Burt Reynolds did a uh, <laughs> cop and a half. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> happens to everybody. So we talked about some of the actors uh, and the performers that we love. What about some of the people behind the camera? I think that the seventies gave us the first films of some of the greatest directors of cinema history. My my personal opinion. So I want to know what you guys think about some of the greatest directors from the 70s. Timothy. Um, I can always see Francis Ford Coppola right on top. Because For sure. Of, because of the two. The only two movies he ever really needed to make. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he calls it quits. I retire as champion. But um, yeah. And then, and then, you know, the blockbuster movies. We're talking about Jaws and uh, Steven Spielberg, I'm sorry, as as Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Star Wars. Um, I Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sp- oh, no. You no, were no, just no. listing Star Wars. Yeah, I, yeah. I just want to clarify so the <laughs> listeners don't think, because, you know, our listeners are nerds. Yes. And, yeah. Indeed. Yeah, you know that Spielberg didn't direct Star no. Wars. <laughs> Right, Timothy. <laughs> <laughs> he seemed to have he seemed to have a little influence. I don't know, um, but yeah, those he definitely had some influence for sure. But uh, the way that I seen the the cinematography back then, all all of those type of directors they they just made it so gritty and so much more realism to things. I mean, just for example, with uh, Francis Ford Coppola making you know the you thought you were part of the Corleone family. You're just uh, realizing what it was like to be in Little Italy or Sicily. Uh, I don't know. I guess I felt like I was one of the nephews or something. Who who knows? (laughs) It's a perfectly crafted movie, and Coppola's directing in it. You're you're right. It makes you feel like you're part of the family. You're right there in the story. Speaking of in the story, (laughs) Justin, what are some of your favorite cinematic directors in the 70s? I mean... uh 
I mean, uh, Scorsese got his start in the 70s, and there's that whole legacy there beginning. You had uh, Francis Ford Coppola. That's probably his best decade. He did yeah. all that and kind of went downhill from there. Uh, I got to say, though, I mean, for real, Steven Spielberg made Hollywood great again. Yeah. Like, that needed to happen. Oh, absolutely. The blockbusters. and that, It turned uh, watching a movie into an event again. Rock on, rock on. What about you, Holshu, Hammer Time that you are? What are some of your favorite directors in the 70s? Uh, we already talked about Francis Ford Coppola. We mentioned Spielberg. Of course, Mel Brooks. Um, you, you've got multiple films uh, in the 70s. Mel, Mel Brooks, hilarious films. And uh, Terry Gilliam, yeah. actually, who did... Uh, who, who I think he came more to his own later in the late 70s and in the 80s when he was more doing his own thing. But he kind of got one of his, his... I think his first feature film... I could be wrong. I, I, I was going to double check. Was uh, Search for the Holy Grail with Monty Python. Right. Yeah, and he did Jabberwocky in the 70s, Yeah, he right? did Jabberwocky in the 70s. You're correct. And uh, yeah, so Terry Gillum is one of my favorite directors of all time. And that was, a you know, 70s. It, it spawned a lot of great directors. And I think you would see these directors coming to their own in the 70s. And again, look, Jaws, for example, and Close Encounters of the Third Time, of uh, Third Kind was Spielberg. And Spielberg goes, I mean... Come on. I mean, that 70s was a big deal in, as far as directors. Absolutely. Uh, some of my favorites, uh, a lot A lot of you guys have mentioned them, but I, I want to like really say Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks did, like he owned the 70s. Like if yeah. you look at his, and I know that Spaceballs and History of the World are really popular and they're from <laughs> the 80s, but his 70s catalog, those are the movies you really think of when you think of Mel Brooks. Yeah, yeah. I do. Like absolutely. Uh, Robert Altman, who did mm. MASH and Nashville, among others in the yeah. 70s. I love Altman's films. I love everything, even like Gosford Park, you know, one early 2000s, but I love Altman's stuff. I think MASH is a fantastic movie, but I think the greatest director, and I like Ridley Scott, I like Steven Spielberg, but like Scorsese, Mm. to have started his film career pretty much in the 70s, to have so many hits and so many movies that are considered classics as his first films, that's a big deal. I got to go with Scorsese on that one. So we were actually talking a bit about Mel Brooks earlier and Monty Python. 70s, not only did it spawn the blockbuster and give us these uh, horror films and these action films, but some great comedy. I think Monty Python was the big start of that because they had transitioned from TV to film. Uh, So I'll start with you, Timothy. Uh, What are some of your favorite 70s comedies or some that stand out in your mind? Um, what we had talked about earlier with Gene Wilder, I actually liked Young Frankenstein. Young Frankenstein is hilarious. Yes. And, um, just the fact that it's black and white and Terry Garr is amazing oh, in it. hilarious. Um, yeah. Roll, roll, roll in the hay. Roll in the hay. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, something, Blazing Saddles, uh, you have to oh, mention. Yeah. I mean, a lot of good slapstick comedy or might have been reinvented then because I know, uh, back before then was you know laurel and hardy and things like that uh but as far as 70s comedy is concerned i think those were some of the top hits yeah the 70s i think huge in in bringing a lot of uh comedic geniuses to light uh goldsmith who from the 70s comedy wise what stands out in your mind films uh from the 70s comedies dude man yeah anything with uh Gene Wilder <laughs> anything from the Monty Python Terry Gilliam Animal House Oh yeah. yeah, big deal. Game changer. Yeah. Uh, uh the Smokey and the Bandit movies, uh Deliverance, uh Deliverance. <laughs> <is a comedy. laughs> well, we are in what? Alabama. <laughs> yeah. well, that, I'm going to throw in the Deer Hunter if we oh, can do that. Well, yeah. <laughs> Jesus, that got really was dark. such a slapstick. You guys have a different sense of humor than I do, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's I mean, they tried a lot of new stuff in the 70s. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Robbie, is there some uh Comedies that stand out in your mind from the 70s. Well, I really do. Like like we were talking about earlier, the domination of Mel Brooks. I mean, think about this. He had 12 Chairs, Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, Silent Movie, and High Anxiety, all in the 70s. And Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein considered probably two of his best films all in the same year. That's crazy. 1974. No kidding. That's crazy. Monty Python, you know, they even... And now for something completely different. I know it's not really quite a movie movie, but it does count as one of the movies. That's 71. Yeah. But Holy Grail in 75 and Life of Brian is so yeah. good. I uh, love yeah. Life of Brian. And Robert Altman's MASH, dude. 
Got to talk about Robert Altman again. MASH is so good with Donald Sutherland. Like, the TV show was cool, but I love that movie. Who, I just love it. Who did Sutherland play in the movie? Oh, he played Hawkeye. Yes. Okay. Yeah. He played a, the I've Arkin a, character. I had seen a bunch of the show, but uh, I've never seen the movie. Oh, it's it, you got to watch it. It's so good. And Robert, what I like about Altman's filmmaking is it's so real to life. It's almost documentarian, but it's not like a mockumentary. But like, you were on the TV show Nashville. Have you ever seen his movie Nashville? No. Dude, it's so good. Like, watch Nashville. Lily Tomlin's in it. Uh, dude, they're so good. And Nashville's a little bit more serious, Are they but it's, it's also funny. To the- is it the same I, kind of story? I, I believe that the TV show is kind of based on that movie. Or inspired. Or yeah. inspired by Dude, that movie. I'm going to have to... It's a great movie, and MASH, like, watch it. It's so good. In 1970 is when MASH came out. John, what about you? What are some of your favorite comedies? I mean, it's a big yeah. decade for comedies, man. Yeah, we already talked about Blazing Saddles a little bit. Uh, of course, uh, Life of Brian, um, Search for the Holy Grail, Young Frankenstein. Um, there was this just... Again, Monty Python... Sure, Holy Grail. We t- they did the one that was like a compilation of skits that they redid, but Search for Holy Grail was their f- f- first feature film where they like wrote a screenplay for the big for the big, and it worked out very well. And again, you had this great comedy team that transitioned to the film industry very very well. And uh, and again, Steve Martin, and you're getting these. Uh, They're all post Saturday Night Live yeah. guys. Yeah, the, you're you're starting to get your Saturday Night Live uh, like Belushi alumni starting to transition to film. Yeah. So that was a big deal too, because you've already have these established comedians or known comedians, but making it to the big again, it doesn't work for everybody. You can there's a lot. I mean, we could probably have some SNL alumni on here that probably doesn't have anything else to do, and they can just <laughs> they can tell you it doesn't always work. It doesn't always transition to bad, big film. Tim Meadows, yeah, but <laughs> it works very well for Steve Martin. But he's a very very funny yeah. guy. Oh yeah, then yeah, Meatballs with uh, Bill Murray again. You get all these people from SNL that. Oh start. yeah, Meatball. What Meatballs yeah. was was that in the seventies? The first one. It was, I thought it was like eighty one. I definitely and mostly think of Meatballs as seventy nine. I always thought okay. of that eighty movie, but but because they did like four or five. Yeah, of them, they did. I think, like, I think Corey Feldman was in a couple of them. Maybe. Yeah, I think I he was. was. I've only seen the first one. <laughs> right. Oh. I, I can't. I haven't seen him since I was a kid. I don't think I'd ever watch him again. <laughs> no. So so again, having those like not only my my Python but people from SNL transitioning over to big screen. So the seventies had a lot of great comedy. But don't the forget ones about Cheech and out, Chong. Cheech and Chong. All Cheech. the Cheech and oh, Chong. Oh well, movies. you guys yeah. always talk about some smoker films, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, we did a whole podcast about it. So uh, we're gonna take a quick break, and we come back and we're talking about the rise of the blockbuster, as well as uh seventies horror. Be right back on Pop Culture Philosophers. Hey everybody, Rockin' Robbie Billups here. I want to talk to you about the Huntsville Comic and Pop Culture Expo. Super excited to announce that the expo will be held at the Von Braun Center North Hall in downtown Huntsville on March 18th and 19th of this year. They got so many new things planned for year two, and we were there for year one. We will be there for year two, so be sure to come and see the Pop Culture Philosophers booth. Come meet us, talk to us, chat us up. It's going to be super, super fun. The theme this year is Level Up, because like Mario eating a mushroom, everything is getting bigger. They're moving from 11 thousand square feet to over 30,000 square feet of space. The main room will be 24,000 square feet and there will be several smaller rooms for all kinds of fun. And they're going to have everything they had last year plus a whole lot more. A lot of gaming, a large discussion panel area, special guests, and a kids area totally dedicated to kids. So check them out at hsvexpo.com. That's right, HSV expo.com and let me tell you real quick the guests are amazing mike grell that's right the writer artist from green arrow will be here chris claremont the man responsible for you loving comic books in the x-men will be there joey fatone from nsync fame and of course family feud and tons of other stuff and david jost the original blue ranger from mighty Morphin power rangers super excited to see that great guest a great con it's going to be super, super fun. Like I said, Pop Culture Philosophers will be there. We hope you will be there in Huntsville, Alabama, Von Braun Center, North Hall, March 18th and 19th, 2017.
Hey everybody, welcome back to Pop Culture Philosophers. Of course, I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. With me, as always, is Hammer Time Holshue. Indeed. Justin Goldsmith. Yo. And Timothy Gorman. How's it going? And tonight, we are talking about 70s movies, and 70s, one of the biggest things that defines film in the 70s, to me, to Justin, to Timothy, and to John, is the blockbuster. It was definitely the rise of the blockbuster. Now, technically, a blockbuster film, and maybe this definition needs to be redefined, of course, today, but it was a movie that grossed over $100 million, and the first movie to do that was Jaws in 1975. So Steven Spielberg undoubtedly created the blockbuster with Jaws. And John Williams had a big deal to do with that too. We will get to him later. But right after that, you got Star Wars. Two years later in 77, also in 77, you got Close Encounters of the Third Kind, another Spielberg film. And then you got Superman in 1978, and then a lot of people don't think about this, but this was a big deal too. In 1979, the Muppet movie, because it incorporated children into the blockbuster. Oh, wow. Okay. And so that really set up the 1980s to really be the decade of the blockbuster. But the 70s is where it started. What are your thoughts on the rise of the blockbuster of this era of film and how it impact films in later generations? Justin. I mean... Uh, up to that point, I think this is the biggest change. Up to that point, everybody always, uh, they saw the movies and they're like, oh, the motion pictures. And it, they kind of put up on a, a pedestal, like a work of art. And then in the 70s, I think, is really when people started becoming, not necessarily celebrity crazy like we are now, but people started going nuts for movies. Like, film was popular. Lots of people watched movies. But it became more of an event to go to the movies. Yes. Like this, this come out and let's go watch it. It's going to be fun. It's going to be awesome. We're going to see explosions and muscle cars and guns. You and muscle cars tonight. I mean, that's seventies. Yeah. That's and one of the star they Wars of. might be one of the first movies that people repeatedly went back to watch. Yeah. Over and over and over again. And I say they did that with jaws too. I'm sure. And jaws had such an impact. It like, sh- it shut down beaches. Like nobody would go to the beach. Like, <laughs> massive cultural influence like yeah you're right like in the early days only a select few got to go to the movie theater right but as time progressed like in the 70s it got a little bit easier for families to go even though really the 80s is where families went almost every week but like the 70s really started that john what are some of your thoughts on that it was uh obviously you said it was jaws was the first big summer blockbuster right is that what you said yes $100 $100 million. <laughs> $100 million. So, so I had to break $100 million anyway to be a blockbuster. So Jaws ended up grossing $260 million, So I think it surpassed it a little bit. Oh, wow. A film that cost $9 million to make. I think they got their return back. I wish I would have invested in the Jaws. And the $9 million was even over budget, right? Yeah, it was like budget for like $4 million. Now, now it was the first blockbuster summer. Oh, should I say, you can't make a TV commercial now for $4 million. You this, can't make a YouTube <laughs> video now for under well, $4 million. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> um, the uh, so it was the big blockbuster, and it brought about this summer blockbuster thing. Where I did air quotes, but I'm on the air. Um, so it brought about the summer blockbuster. That's and why them, you did air quotes. And them releasing a big <laughs> summer film. But Jaws also it wasn't just coincidence that it became this big film. The studio pushed the shit out of this film. This was a time when film companies didn't advertise as much on television, and Universal went ape shit. With TV. Well, by in the 70s, everybody had a television. Yes, this yeah. is true. And they spent, but they also spent a ton advertising the shit out of this film. And also, uh, films didn't get wide releases in the way that we know. When we say a movie's coming out on Friday, you, you're expecting every theater to have this movie on Friday. This wasn't the case back then, even in the 70s. Uh, but Jaws was one of those first early films where it pushed it to a wide audience. And the opening day was 435 film, uh, theaters. So not only did you bring it to the masses and advertise the shit out of it, so those those two things help uh, uh, propel it to being a blockbuster. You can't expect it to be a blockbuster and have it in 50 theaters. Yeah. Now, eventually, these films that released, the film print made it to other theaters. Now, these films that all make it to other theaters and you know would get a wide release in the long run, but not in the way that Jaws was, and it was pushed on day one. And that it, I mean, it did change the film forever. And that led on to those other movies, Close Encounters, Star Wars. Yeah, and Absolutely. now it was the rush to see who could capitalize on the big summer money. You know, kids are out of school. Um, uh, people are on spring or uh, summer vacation. 
and they're they're out to make you know they're bored. They're going to go to the theater. Oh yeah. You know they want to these movies want come something out exciting around Memorial Day. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's actually it seems like it started off summer blockbuster, but now it's like spring. But it seems to be mer- further and further. They definitely up in the moved year. the season up and back. Yeah, to try to yes. ex- capitalize that, they want to expand it. Yes. Here's the summer blockbuster time. It's back during the summer. In, back in the day, a movie that the studio didn't trust came out in August, but now like Guardians of the Galaxy came out in August. You know, like. And what a piece of shit film. Yeah, right? <laughs> Speaking of piece of shit film, Timothy. <laughs> what do you think about the rise of the blockbuster in the 1970s, man? I can believe like in the set, uh, in, in 1970, uh, 1975, right? Yeah. When Jaws came out. Um, yeah, it made, it made people consider not going into the water. It's, I didn't want to fucking use the toilet. Yeah. And no one um, thought of... <laughs> Of uh, a friendly, yeah. a friendly shark. I, I don't know if you want to say it that way. As a, a shark. as Bruce, yeah, <laughs> Bruce ain't friendly. As um, an antagonist, as a evil defining character, and um, yeah, that's what we were talking about. How seventies became the golden era because of definitive characters, and 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 people are flocking to see a movie that they don't realize is going to be so iconic, so uh, influential for everything that's just come out now. I mean, you have, like, I don't know, Alvin and the Chipmunks or something. Some (laughs) movies that just come out and they have, uh, you know, worldwide cinematic uh, uh, venture value. And you're you're just thinking to yourself, man, it started out with Jaws. And um, those Spielberg films, like you were mentioning... Close Encounters, uh, um, not Star Wars, Star Wars. <laughs> but um, yes, all those other films. God, they are um, they they all take credit because of Jaws. So, absolutely, Jaws started it, and I really think Star Wars cemented it. Like Star Wars, like because Jaws has sequels, <coughs> but Star Wars has super successful sequels. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And obviously, the '80s is the era of the sequel. But that started in the seventies too, because you had Godfather two, and that kind of like was one of the one of the only sequels that really like almost surpasses the first one in a lot of people's minds. But dude, Jaws, Close Encounters, and then seriously, Star Wars, a very very big deal. So when you mentioned blockbusters, and you said one hundred million dollars, what cements it as a blockbuster, or that's the threshold, right? Or it was back then. Maybe that's changed. <clears throat> I think it definitely should shift now. I mean, so the number one grossing film of the seventies was Star Wars. The number two was Jaws, which started the blockbuster. Do you know what the number three grossing film of the 1970s was? What is it? The Exorcist. Oh, The Exorcist is a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Hey, what How do you know? How much did it gross? I thought it would be $204 million is what it gross. But I oh. thought it would be another one of these, you know, Close Encounters or Godfather, one of these other epic films. Yeah, The Exorcist was a big deal. It was. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. But first, another big thing that happened that made blockbusters and movies so popular and contributed to being more and more blockbusters was home video, which really kind of took off in the 80s. But the first VHS was released when, John? 1976. Tell us about it, homie. So the 70s, there was two formats introduced, VHS, which is the video home system, and Betamax. Well, Betamax was introduced by Sony, and obviously it didn't fare well because we're not talking about it today. We're talking about VHS. So video home system. I never knew that's what it stood for. That's so simple. It makes perfect sense. And a lot of people think VCR because that's the, that's, the, that's the version that records. But VHS. So that was the first, uh, that was the first home uh, video cassette. Um, and this changed everything because uh, getting movies into your home, you either watch like, the movie of the week on TV or there was like reels. But VHS really changed. And there was like RCA selective. There was a bunch of little things that didn't quite take off. But VHS was the first big deal uh, as far as home uh, videos for the masses. And uh, the first uh, VHS film was the South Korean drama, The Young Teacher, released in 76. And uh, yeah, it was it was the... I, I've already talked about everything. I jumped ahead. <laughs> it was... I mean, it really did change home viewing for the masses. And I think even though there's some younger people here on the show, everybody's familiar with VHS. And we've all had movies on VHS, even Goldsmith, right? You had VHS films. I you didn't start with DVD, VHS. right? <laughs> no. okay. I don't watch them, but I got them. I still okay. got one movie on VHS. It's Suburbia by Richard Linklater. I don't think it's ever been released on DVD or Blu-ray. So oh, I still have a VHS. I don't even have VCR anymore. I'm sure there's a torrent somewhere probably. And we all had the, uh, you had the, uh, the VHS. 
player, you had the the rewinder. Remember they had that separate rewinder? Oh, and dude, you were you were hardcore if you had that separate rewinder. Yeah, and you also would get dinged I by worked the, at the video, video company. Store. You had to rewind it. Please be yeah. kind, rewind. Be kind, and no, rewind. Nobody did. People are lazy. But we had those machines. We had like five of them. You got to rewind them, put them back yeah. on the tape. And then you sons of bitches putting the damn rewind stickers on the DVDs. I know you guys did because I saw them. Somebody did. <laughs> I'm like, why is this sticker on here? I thought it was I'm not funny. Rewind, I'm not rewinding this DVD. They can eat a bag of dicks. I thought it was funny. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> another big thing about the 70s is the use of music in movies. And there was, there was always music used in movies ever since the inception of film, really. You know? Yeah. Um, in fact, music was very important to silent films. <laughs> You know, honestly, and they would play it from a, like a phonogram or a uh, like an orchestra. Would yeah, you have a live music yeah. for it, yeah. But um, really in the 70s, I think scores really started becoming a really big deal. And you know, guy, you, if you listen to the show, if you know me, you know that I love talking about music in film. It's one of my absolute favorite things to talk about. Um, so I want to know what, what to you are, are some of the best scores and or soundtracks, but it was mostly scores back then, you know, but and soundtracks though, because Saturday Night Fever. I was gonna oh, say yeah. that's a hellaciously. All right, then Timothy, we're gonna start with you. What are some of the best scores and or soundtracks of the seventies? Well, that now that you mentioned, I guess the uh, Saturday Night Fever, with you got the disco, the boom of the disco, and you have uh, Bee Gees. Oh yeah, the Bee Gees. More than a woman. Yeah, dominated disco. Man, yeah. Bee Gees were huge. Jive talking, all those, all those fancy. Saturday Night Fever yeah. night. <laughs> I know if 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 dude right now I'm dancing in my head exactly even kiss getting kiss and I was thinking to it. myself I was thinking to myself I can just do that point and 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 jam a little bit but um honestly the, the, there's a lot of different scores a lot of different movies uh that have you know Jaws has has the violins um Godfather all all of those movies have the violins they all have the things that um crescendo and and jump to yeah well, violins were violins were invaded invented in the 70s and so they started using <laughs> them in every film what are we going to use with these new funky guitar things oh put them in film we will pluck them oh wait no we should use some type of feathery thing on it i don't know <laughs> i think it's i think it's called a bow yeah or a bow <laughs> or a feathery thing i like that, I like that. <laughs> but i do like some of the um the the scores the, all the different soundtracks that uh, were very popular. Were always the ones uh, Jaws or, um, like I said, Saturday Night Life, uh, Saturday Night Fever. What about you, uh, John? What do you think? I would say uh, there was a lot of great soundtracks, a lot of great scores. I, I would say the dominant. Um, you may want to come back to me. <laughs> I was going to say the dominant is is <laughs> I, if I look at my favorite scores for the seventies, my very favorite ones are Jaws, Superman. Yeah. And Star Wars. All right. That is all John Williams. It's all John Williams. Tell us a little bit about John Williams. John Williams, like, he, he really defined the blockbuster soundtrack. Because, so, he did all these. So, he started a little bit. He did a little film here, dabbed in films. He built a relationship with Irwin Allen, who did those uh, disaster films. So, Poseidon Adventure and The Towering Inferno. Um, and then... And then, of course, he'd go on to later do the soundtrack also for Earthquake. So he did the trifecta of all, all the disaster films. And then uh, he was approached by Spielberg to do Jaws. And then it was his relationship with Spielberg. And Spielberg said, hey, you know, my buddy, George, is doing this sci-fi film. I think you'd be good for the soundtrack. And he ended you know, introducing him and doing Star Wars. You know, you mentioned uh, Earthquake just now. <clears throat> and while we're talking about soundtrack, I think it's very important to note that the 1974 movie Earthquake, which was almost a blockbuster, I think it got like 70 million or something like that, 70 mm -hmm. or 80 million, um, was the first film that was developed by Universal with this process called Surround Scope or something like that. Okay. And it was their attempt to uh, make audio in theaters better. And I think that was a big uh, contribution to the boom, wh why movies became so big. And that movie, Earthquake, that system sur surround something. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, was the first film to use a subwoofer, really, in a theater? Mm. 
and they started using those, and I'm sure they had them installed by so the that time was the prod- Jaws and the Star Wars came out. To today's surround sound. Yeah. And then uh, eventually, like something like DTS, which started with Batman Returns, by the way. Yeah. Oh, oh right. Didn't that, that's an that's 80s film. That's very interesting. Or 90s yeah. film. But you know, we always tell oh. Justin to come up with something that nobody else knows, yeah. and th- I think this is the first time he's ever delivered. <laughs> But what about the <laughs> the <laughs> Halloween stuff? The, the pumpkins? The party stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Justin, what what do you think are some of the best soundtracks and scores of the 70s? I really like the uh, Dawn of the Dead soundtrack a oh, lot. Oh, yes. That's Goblin. Yeah. I was playing you some Goblin earlier. Yeah, you were. Yeah, that's the same dudes, man. Yeah. So that, um, the, the Godfather soundtrack is just like one of the all-time... Yeah. I mean, it's beautiful music, but yeah. it also it makes you think. And they use like it's so part of pop culture that any time they reference, even in commies and stuff, a mafia type, they use that. Yeah. Style Did you say of music. even in commies and stuff, Co- comedies, comedies. <laughs> <laughs> even in communist films. Right. Well, it's um, I haven't really done a lot of research on it. Movies that came out before that, but it seems like uh, this was the time when the. Uh, video presentation and the audio really started to come together because uh, it's not that a whole lot less like like stock music was yeah. used yeah yeah like more original. it's it was it's like movies became mixed with the opera or something like and maybe that. that has to do yeah. with the blockbuster too but like we can't cut corners on the music if we want to make the money out. and I think yeah. I think another big deal is that you can also just do a soundtrack you can like you can do you don't have to have John Williams do your your movie you can have the Bee Gees do it yeah. right. You know, and I, that really started. What with if the, they combine those? That two? really started. Or, whoa! You, that really started in. <laughs> si- that really started in '69 with the Graduate, where okay. it was Simon and Garfunkel. Yeah, right? great yeah. soundtrack. Yeah. yeah, and then and that that that's something that continues on into today. And then you got a movie that nobody's mentioned yet, Grease. Grease. Yes. Grease. It's the way we're feeling. Dude, Grease has a, a really good soundtrack. Yeah. Half of it's really good. I'm not a fan of Grease, and I love musicals, but I'm not, not a fan. I like half of Grease. <laughs> All right. So I'm, the gra- I, I just first say half that. or the second half? Yeah, what made it <laughs> no, it's, it's, not so it's pieces of pieces throughout. <laughs> that was the right. fourth most successful Like I love film Summer Lovin'. In the 70s, I love Summer Lovin' and Grease Lightning. Yeah. And what's the other one? What's the other one? You're the one that I want. Yeah. Right? Oh, that's but a I hate Mega Mix. Stuff, stuff like, yeah, right? I like right. the Mega Mix, right? But stuff like Beauty School Dropout, mm-hmm. that scene is so stupid. <laughs> it's I, so stupid, so stupid. I think I want to mention one that... Not well, your time's already come and gone, Timothy. Uh, <laughs> I believe the Rocky Horror Picture Show oh, has, yes. has such a great soundtrack. Well, I haven't yeah. listed mine yet. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, before you no, know, no, I'm doing my last right one. I feel stupid. I'm not getting out of this without mentioning... I can't... I was so mad, I almost forgot this movie was in the 70s. Star Trek, the motion picture... And yes. that was one of the ones you were going to mention, wasn't it? No. Oh, really? I was just well, like, I'm glad I brought it up. I'm, yeah, I thought you would. Uh, it's the piece is so good that it became the theme for the next generation. Yeah, right. And whenever you th- <laughs> whenever you think of Star Trek, there it is. Yeah, you think of that more than you think of the original. Yeah. song. Absolutely, Timothy. I'm right with you. Rocky Horror Picture Show. That's that. That's amazing. Time Warp. Sweet Transvestite. Yes. That was actually oh all done by John Williams as well. Yes. Most people don't know that. <laughs> yeah, and the John Williams stuff is fantastic. But like straight up for me, Dawn of the Dead yeah. is Goblin. Suspiria. Is that also the, Goblin? They did, yeah, that's also Goblin. That's oh. that's probably my number one favorite soundtrack of the 70s is Suspiria. Wait, so so jumping, we'll jump back. We can take this out of the show. But the 80s, uh, Dream Warriors, who's that by? Dokken. Are they related to Goblin in any way no. at all? No. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Anyway, so I really like Goblin doing those movies, and they did a lot of other things. They did the Profundo Rosso score or Deep Red, like so good. Nino Rota did The Godfather, and that theme, you know, the da na 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 na, it's so good, and that music wraps you up in that movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it at times it's just a really simple like mandolin or something like that. I thought it was. A stringed instrument, you know? Correct. But then it, at other times it swells into this giant whole thing with like strings and horns and it's beautiful and engrossing and it's so emotional, man. Mm-hmm. So emotional. And like you said, John, it really, a lot of people when they do gangster stuff, even in parody, they, they ape on that. Yeah. Um, also, want to mention you talked about Jerry Goldsmith, yeah, doing Star Trek. Yeah, he did the Omen, man. Oh yeah, and the oh. Omen has some great music, and also the the Tubular Bells from The Exorcist. Yeah, and Halloween. Yeah, John Carpenter's Halloween. 
I had just thought about that a minute ago, and we yeah. didn't mention him during directors at all. Yeah, we sure did. But he started and, and he, he did yeah, his music. He, he did Assault on Precinct Thirteen. That's yeah. a great score as well. Um, so those are some really good scores, and I think they had some really good music. And we talked a lot about the horror movies, but before we get to that, one of the things that's going to become important to the the summer blockbuster and to, unfortunately, in my opinion, horror movies today, CGI. Oh, yeah. John, I believe that the Peter 70s Rankins. has the very first use of CGI in a film. Why don't you tell us about it? The very first use. So I think a lot of people, they think of introduction of CGI in film. I think a lot of people think of Tron. And that was the first extensive use, and that's in the 80s. But the actual first appearance of any type of computer graphics is actually the uh, uh, Michael Crichton classic film, (laughs) Westworld. (laughs) So Westworld uh, was the first feature film to use CGI. It actually used, uh, uh, I think it's Racer graphics. It's basically like a dot matrix two-dimensional graphics. So it wasn't 3D, but it was still computer-generated. And it's actually the Yul Brenner when he's hunting down... Uh, so the man in black, when he's hunting down the guy and he's, you're showing his vision, his vision's this this pixely uh, appearance of characters. And that was done in CG. And that was, again, people people knock Westworld. or you know I think up until the new show, people either forgot or didn't know or didn't care about Westworld. <laughs> But it was it was big on on and it influenced films forever because that was the first use of CGI and that was in uh, I think seventy six I think was the I don't have it written down but I think seventy six was Westworld. Another director we didn't mention, Michael Crichton. <laughs> Michael Crichton, who's really not a director. <laughs> now, I yeah. am a huge Michael Crichton fan. Like yeah, I yeah. am not even lying. Andromeda Strain, Andromeda Strain, Sphere, Congo, Jurassic Park, yeah. of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, Timeline. I love those books. The, some of the movies are not the greatest. Like my favorite Michael Crichton book is Sphere. But that's like such a terrible movie. Really? He created ER. Yeah. As well. But yeah, it's so odd that he directed Westworld. He didn't he didn't want to direct. Brenner, by he the got way. kind of roped into it. Yeah, but Yul Brenner, by the way. Super scary in that movie. He is. And he was a great he's a great was a great actor and he was in a lot of great films in the seventies as well. You were talking about Michael Crichton not being one of the greatest <laughs> directors of the seventies. Yeah. One of the greatest directors of the seventies, in my opinion, and I think his best work is in the seventies, was Dario Argento. Mm. Dario Argento directed Suspiria, directed um, the Cat with Nine Tails, The Bird with Crystal Plumage. He's an Italian director. Home okay. Alone. Uh, no, not <laughs> <laughs> Profondo Rosso, which is Deep Red. And I, I think he's amazing. I think horror movies in the 70s, I think is one of the greatest decades of horror. Absolutely. There was a big boom. There's this theory. And the first, I, I, I subscribed to this theory. And the first time I heard it was from Eli Roth, who directed Hostel and Cabin Fever and, and movies like that. That's it. You really named his, his only two good films. He's done other films, but those are his only two good films. I like Green Inferno. I haven't seen Green Inferno. Mm. Infernal. What? <laughs> but the idea is that the great booms in American horror cinematic history come after great times of crisis, socially and, and culturally. And so, for instance, the greatest, there was the first big boom was like in the 30s with all the Universal Monster movies. And that was the Great Depression, a response to that, right? Yeah. And then in the 50s, you got all these sci-fi movies like Them, and mm-hmm. it came from outer space, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, after you World know? War II and after, Invaders after the first from, atomic yeah. bomb. So yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so it's the you know nuclear fear and all that. So, And then you have a big boom in the 70s, and it's post-Vietnam, right? And you got a lot of great movies that come out from that time. Dario Gento is one of the greatest directors of that time there's a, a few others you got george romero yeah yeah operating at that time you got um john carpenter mm-hmm. you got wes craven it really starts first of all with like a lot of responses to interest into the occult and trying to scare people back into church so you got the exorcist in 1973 that was followed by texas chainsaw massacre in 74 then you got the omen in 76 suspiri in 77 Dawn of the Dead and Halloween in 78. And Dawn of the Dead, the Romero classic, also produced by Dario Argento and a soundtrack by Goblin. And then you got Phantasm, I think that caps it off in 1979, a perfect response to the Vietnam War. Check out our PCP movie night on YouTube right now. I elaborate a little further on the Vietnam War uh, theme that's in Phantasm because it's there, but you got to look for it. Um, some I think it's a great time for horror movies. I love them. I just listed some of my favorites right there. Um, Justin, favorite horror movies of the seventies? Dawn of the Dead. 
great movie, man. It, and it speaks about consumerism. Like yeah. before the mall even became a thing, George Romero saw that. You know what I'm saying? Like people weren't mall crazy in the 70s, in the mid 70s. That really happened in the 80s, but he like foresaw that. Like, yeah, I love that movie. And social commentary is a big thing in the 70s movie. Why, do, why, why does that one stand out? It, I, when I was a kid, I think it was uh, that my, it's one of my dad's favorite movies too. And he rock on. He showed it to me when I was like 12, 10, 12, something like that. Perfect. Younger change. kid. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, it's, I think it was that I watched it and I had never really watched a lot of older movies before. And it was, it seemed like it was the first modern horror movie, if that makes sense. Well, it had a lot of like gore. Yeah. You know, and like, but you uh, can, but you yeah. can watch it and it's got like, it still seems like it's contemporary, sort of. Like, it doesn't feel as old as it is, if that makes sense. It's kind of weird. Speaking of not feeling as old as it is, <laughs> Timothy. <laughs> 70s believe, horror movies, man. When I look at a few that um, you can always see the uh, ultra-violent, uh, I don't know if, if you would count A Clockwork Orange as a horror film. Um, maybe in a dystopian way. A lot of people do. I'm not sure what category you'd put that in. Right. It's definitely effed up, but at yeah. the same time, yeah. I, I'm more into um, like revenge plots. So since I mentioned Dustin Hoffman, I really like Straw Dogs in Ooh, 71. Oh, Straw Dogs and Marathon Man. Right. Yeah. Those type of movies are real and could happen and is very creepy in, in, in that form of sense. It's just like, you can't be too safe at home because you know that there's always some type of hoodlums or teenagers that feel like they want to be punkish and angsty and and uh absolutely and I think that that some of that gore that we saw from the Vietnam War really led to that right. and it led to the realism of the death in these movies. Oh yeah. And speaking of death, John <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> 70s horror, man. What stands out to you, buddy? I think you and, kinda, and before you go on, yeah. I just want to mention, because I said Wes Craven, but Last House on the Left and Hills Have Eyes, two very important movies in the 70s Oh, yeah. Well. Very great movie. Yeah, that was really Wes Craven started his, his horror films in the 70s, and that became something that defined him. Like, oh, Wes Craven, he makes horror films. Like, that's his thing. But that wasn't how he started. But that just, again, those are the two big films for him and kind of uh, changed his career path. So uh, besides those films... Uh, the Wicker Man, uh, Phantasm, you like you said, Dawn of the Dead. You already said Suspiria. Uh, Exorcist was that top grossing horror film like we talked. Halloween's one of my personal favorites from from the seventies. Talked about the Omen. Talked about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. One thing we I don't think we mentioned yet was a horror film set in space. That's Alien. Yeah, which is oh, very yeah. tail end of the seventies. That's really Scott. People think of Alien. I think almost people think of uh, action film. And the subsequent sequels were definitely action films, but the original Alien is a horror film. Yeah. Yes, right. it's science fiction, but it's a horror film. And it's got the pacing of a horror film. And really, Scott intended it to be a horror film. He said that he wanted to make a haunted house movie in space. Yeah. And I think that's what he did. And that was <laughs> I probably probably the best horror film in yeah, space until we got Leprechaun in space years later. No, Event Horizon. <laughs> No, Jason 10. No, <laughs> X. First it's off, it's Jason X. X. Uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, Event Horizon is a great horror movie. It, it is actually yeah. a good movie. The other one, the one Leprechaun in Space, is a terrible fucking movie. <laughs> M- millennials don't know anything about Roman numerals. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what guys. What Super Bowl is this? Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, guys, we appreciate everything. We thank you for listening. We'll be right back with our top five favorite movies of the 70s. Oh, I'm excited to hear the top five. Here on Pop Culture Philosophers after this quick break. Hey everybody, Rock and Robbie here. I want to talk to you real quick about our YouTube channel. Be sure, if you haven't already, to get onto YouTube to the Pop Culture Philosophers channel and be sure to subscribe. We do tons of things there. I got a weekly comic book review I do that's doing pretty well. People seem to really like it. Also, we got movie reviews, we got discussions, we got tons of stuff, including full episodes of previous podcasts available on YouTube and the exclusive to YouTube podcast, Rockin' with Rock and Robbie, which is returning very, very soon with an all new episode lies and fish so get on youtube go to pop culture philosophers and give us a subscribe thank you very much
Hey everybody, Rock and Robbie here. Welcome back to Pop Culture Philosophers. We've been talking about 70s movies. I'm here, of course, with Hammer Time Holshu. Yep, yep. Justin Goldsmith. Yo. And Timothy Gorman. It is the end of the world as we know it. And we are talking about 70s movies, as I said, but we're about to get to our top five favorite movies of the 70s, our favorite part of the show, The Meat, if you will. The Meat. <laughs> but first, we want to give a shout out to Jason from RCR Reviews. That's right. Check him out on Facebook. Check him out on Twitter. Check him out on SoundCloud, I believe is where you can find their podcast. But definitely go to rcrreviews.com. And check them out. Jason's one of the top guys at RCR, and he says his favorite movie from the 1970s is the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Nice. That's, That's a, good, a good pick. And I'm very interested to know everybody else's top five. Aren't you, John? I am not. Fuck everybody. Up here. <laughs> no, I am, because honestly, again, that we say this all the time, but it was hard to break that down to just five. The 70s, I mean, it's a whole decade of great films. So I'm interested to see what people narrow down their top five to because, again, it was a hard thing to do. It really was. Okay, we're going to start with our number five. And we'll start with Timothy. Uh, your, your top five. Uh, what was your number five favorite film of the 70s? The whole decade of the 70s. Narrow down to what's your number five. And just so you know, we're talking about 1970s, not 1870s. No. Okay. <laughs> 1970 to 1979. <laughs> And did it all the way up to 1979, December 31st. Does Midnight. it have violins in it? I hope so. <laughs> I hope it's got violins in it. Well, no. Um, I like to throw in a movie from 1973, which is called Enter the Dragon, starring Bruce oh, Lee. Oh, yeah. great film. Great film. It was definitely an influence, and it was definitely something that um, I could not take uh, off the list. And John Saxon. Mm -hmm. Sexy oh, ass John Saxon's in that. <laughs> he would make a good father of shit i got nancy yes, yeah. nancy's, dad. <laughs> nancy's dad is all i most for some reason my brain but that's a great cast and a great film why is that why is that in your top five what stands out in that film in your mind well i mean all the different scenes that happen uh leading into uh his final fight with dr claw uh spoiler alert Not i guess the guy from inspector gadget right <laughs> but um a lot of mirrors i mean it's just the whole definitive thing of Bruce Lee. Yeah. yeah, and Bruce Lee's not only this iconic actor, but the film itself is a big part of pop culture. It really is. It's an iconic film. Robbie, what is your number five? I'm curious to know. Uh, my number five is from 1977. It's Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Oh, great film. And how, why does that make your top five? It makes my top five because I think it's one of my favorite movies about aliens. It's one of my favorite Spielberg films. The John Williams score in that movie. You know, like Everybody talks about Star Wars. They talk about Indiana Jones. They talk about Superman. Dude, Close Encounters. Like... I love that movie. It's my favorite Richard Dreyfus movie. Or Dreyfus? Yeah. It's Dreyfus. Dreyfus. <laughs> it's my favorite Richard Dreyfus movie. Richard Dreyfus is his cousin. But <laughs> his German cousin. I just I love it. It really speaks to me and I think I think that is a movie with purpose and I really like the cinematic um themes like that relate to things like the story of Moses and Mount Sinai in that movie. We talked about it on our movie night. It's on YouTube. Everybody can check it out to know more about it, but I love that movie, man. It's so good, magical. It's, it's magical. Yeah, it's a fantastic film. It makes me want to eat mashed potatoes. And every time I eat, I was about to say that every time I eat mashed potatoes, I think about this yeah. movie. <laughs> you always put them in that same mound. <laughs> um, you're number five, Goldsmith. You're an actor. I'd like to. I'm really interested to see what your top five is. Which means you're number five, sir. There was no way that this movie wasn't going to be on my top five, and it's the one that I almost forgot about. <laughs> Star Trek: The Motion Picture. Nice. It's. I mean. It's a slow movie, let's be honest. But it is art. I think it deserves to be slow. Yeah, yeah. It like it is just so pretty, and the music is so good, and the yeah. feel. It's just you're just watching. It's like it's like watching Picasso paint a picture. It's gonna take a long time, but it's beautiful. My number five is a little my little oddities. These are my favorite films. These may not be Oscar winners, but everybody yeah. loves this film. And my number five is gonna be. Young Frankenstein. Oh, uh, great film. Great Frankenstein. Film. <laughs> Frankenstein. So, so how could I not have a Mel Brooks film on my top five? I love that film. That's my favorite Mel Brooks film. And again, Gene Wilder. And I do love Blazing Saddles. So Blazing Saddles would have made my was close to make my top five. For some reason, it was Young Frankenstein that I watched a thousand times as a kid. Probably because Blazing Saddles, I felt like I was watching something inappropriate when I watched it. <laughs> great film, though. I love Gene Wilder. Anybody ask, I love Gene Wilder. Number four, Timothy. Um, I would have to say Godfather Part 1 from 1972. Classic film, great film. 
Um, it started off quite a bit uh, of Pacino, um, Robert De Niro as a young Vito Colerone, Colleone, sorry, and um, just just all the different cinematography and and the semantics of the film. It's very ultra violent, which I, of course, in other podcasts I love. So, yeah, it's and a great it's, movie. The, the cast, holy crap, the cast. Uh, Robbie, what was your number four? Uh, Ridley Scott, nineteen seventy nine, Alien. Oh, love it! Fantastic horror movie super scary and it has scenes that you remember it's got a very strong female lead uh sigourney weaver is amazing in it everybody's yeah. good in it uh the dad from picket fences is in it hmm. and of course john hurt and it's just it's just utterly terrifying it's got a great score as well it perfectly written perfectly executed and i think it's set up ridley scott to be one of the premier directors of the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And the effects. Go back and watch it. Yes. The effects are phenomenal because so they almost they almost take a back seat to everything else. And it makes you feel so just vulnerable. It makes you feel vulnerable, man. And, and everything's so slimy and penis looking. It's just, <laughs> it's just, it's scary. Yeah. I'm never, <laughs> wow. phallic is that the is word. Phallic. I'm never going to space, yeah. ever. You're number four. Talk about penis you You're number four, Goldsmith. <laughs> Well, we've been doing uh, movies from the late 70s. I'm going to go back to 71, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, nice. Another Gene Wilder yeah. film. I, uh, spoilers, I don't have a Mel Brooks movie on my top five, but I just there's no way getting around having uh, Gene Wilder in there. Can you imagine if Mel Brooks did Willy Wonka? <laughs> it would be hilarious. <laughs> it would be really It'd be like funny. an episode of Family Guy. Be it's like a great the, movie. <laughs> did that movie not make you want to like go to that Chocolate Factory? Yeah, it's and, so, like, just, like, the yeah. music, the, everything about that movie is magical. And again, Gene Wilder's got such presence, and he's just such a great job. Holy yeah. shit. My number four is uh, the first superhero film I ever saw, and changed me as a youth. It changed my life forever. That was Superman. Oh, I thought you were going to say French Connection. <laughs> <laughs> Superman was a huge deal, and that soundtrack. Talk about John Williams. Holy shit, that soundtrack. The theme literally says, Superman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every theme should have the name of the movie in the song. <laughs> Such a great movie. So Superman's my number four. Uh, Timothy, I'd love to know your number three, sir. From 1976, I chose Taxi Driver. Ah, a yeah. young, a young De Niro. Yeah, in his prime. And directed by Scorsese, right? Yes. Um, those types of films that the character actor Robert De Niro and the way he goes about seeing gritty New York life, and uh, he he's just phenomenal. He said that he had to actually drive. Uh, be a cab driver for for months just to go and uh, learn his craft as and, dedication. And luckily, that film never encouraged anybody to shoot anybody. No, never. Too soon. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> was it Reagan? Yeah, it was Reagan. It was what's his face? Yeah, it was Reagan. Over uh, what was her name? Sybil Shepherd. God damn, it's not Sybil. <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> Jody Foster. Jody Foster. <laughs> I thought you were asking. <laughs> They're both in the film. Yeah. yeah, they are. They are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> God damn it. Robbie, what's your number three? My number three is the classic Coppola classic, that is. From the 72, it's oh, Godfather. Oh, Dracula. It's oh. Godfather. <laughs> no, it's Godfather, and it's Godfather Part 1. The first one, yeah. Godfather Part 2 is not on my list. I think it's a great movie and a great sequel, but contrary to what many people think, I think Godfather is the better film. Right. Oh, yeah. And I think Brando adds an element to it, and I think James Caan adds an element to it. Like I just love, I like the story of my. Obviously, the Godfather saga from one to three is the story of Michael Corleone. Yes, but I think Vito and Sonny add so much to the first movie, and I just love it so much. And it, it just like we said earlier, like who was it? whoever I think it was Timothy that said it made you feel like you're part of the family. You know, and that's that's right. I didn't even think about that, but it really is like that. When scene, you're here, we don't. Yeah, your family. It, it just <laughs> it makes you feel like. Why do I want breadsticks right now? It's the first movie that really make you feel like there's something honorable about about being a gangster, and and the whole renaissance of popular gangster films as gangsters as protagonists like Goodfellas and Scarface and stuff like that. That Godfather, they yeah. owe it all to the Godfather, and Godfather handles it so much better than any of those movies. Like, I think Scorsese is a better director than Coppola. But Coppola made a better gangster movie than Scorsese ever did. So your number three, Goldsmith. Star Wars. Oh, <laughs> is that supposed to be the Star Wars music? That's yeah, fucking terrible. Yeah, I was hearing. That's You're not stopped. singing it correctly for license. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, get sued. Exactly. He wasn't doing the most familiar parts. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is the opening, the credits. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Okay. Well, yeah, Star Wars. Do I have to explain it? 
Let's just move on. What's oh, this? <laughs> what's this? What's this film about? It's Star Wars. It's got one of my favorite actors in it as one of the coolest characters in any movie ever. Han Solo. Uh, again, we're going back Vader. to cool. Okay. Yeah. Han Solo. Yeah. Darth Vader was pretty fucking cool though. Yeah, he was too. James Earl Jones. He, that was a film as a kid that I saw and like. I wanted to be the bad guys because they looked way cooler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I did not side with the good guys. At they all. really did. Yeah. But I mean, the music. It's epic. It's an awesome story and. I'm sure a lot of our fans dis- uh, would agree. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure Absolutely. there's a lot of them that are upset that it's my number three. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you bastard. My number three, um, I, I, one of my favorite directors of all time, and Robbie can attest to this, is Cherry Gilliam. So, of course, mm. I've got... Did you say Sh- Cherry Gilliam? <laughs> he did sound like he said Cherry. <laughs> Cherry Gilliam is his stepbrother who goes on tour yeah, as the fruit, his name. Yeah, the fr- fruit. <laughs> <laughs> he owns a fruot company. I'm just, I lost it. Go ahead. Cherry Gilliam... <laughs> <laughs> who did some of my favorite films of all time, Time Bandits, Brazil, et cetera. Oh, Brazil is a great movie. But he also did Monty Python's Search for the Holy Grail. I love that film. Yeah. Hilarious. How about hilarious films? And Search for the Holy Grail, I think, is one of the funniest films dead, of all time. <laughs> it's oh, great. I, Dude, I watched that in AP European history. <laughs> nice. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I wish my high school was like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you, sh- you should have taken yeah. the smart courses, John. I took the dumb ones. <laughs> so now we're on number two. Uh, Timothy, give me your number two, if you could. This movie came in 1974. It's called Chinatown by Jack Nicholson, Roman Polanski, Faye Dunaway. Who directed that, do you recall? It, it was Polanski. Oh, Polanski was director. Obviously, he's not an actor. He told <laughs> you. You said it was Polanski. Roman Polanski. <laughs> I wasn't listening to you. I was writing it down. <laughs> yeah, it is a Roman Polanski film. So Chinatown, why does that make your top five? There's a lot of great films from the 70s, and Chinatown's a great film, by the way. I think overlooked by a lot of people because it wasn't a blockbuster by today's no. standards or even the 70s standards, but it was a successful film. Well, like I said, I, I really am a huge fan of Nicholson, and, and just it's a mystery noir type feel. Um, it was set in L.A., so it had like a Hollywood type of uh, mystery murder situation. Yeah. So, I mean... Not it was a big throwback to those 40s films. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah and it's a very young Nicholson. He does a fantastic job. Right. Um, and, I, and I do just like the, the whole cinematography of that as well. That is a great number two. That's a great film. I love Nicholson. Robbie, your number two. My number two is your number five, 1974, Mel Brooks, Young Frankenstein. Really? Love that movie. Uh, anybody that listens to the show or knows me knows I love universal horror movies. Love them. Frankenstein's one of them. And Mel Brooks not only made one of my, he made my favorite comedy. If you listen to the Smile or Else comedies episode, I, this is my favorite comedy. He made such a loving tribute to those James Whale Frankenstein movies, man. He like he went out and found the one guy that was still alive who had been a cinematographer back then to make the movie look like it was filmed back then. Yeah, it they, does. They used the same props and some of the same set material from the original Frankenstein movies and Bride of Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. It's such a loving tribute, and it's one of the funniest things ever, It is dude. hilarious. Did they actually get the same set pieces? Yes. Some like, a lot same. of those those mechanical constructs are the exact same ones, man. All like the, the original stuff, pieces? Yes. Oh, that's probably cool. everything they could they recover. They found the dude who had it in his warehouse or whatever. I had no idea. That's <clears> awesome. But it's such a beautiful film. It really is, and it's got a it's just so poignant. And it film you're right, the way they, they film it, it feels so much older. Yes. I mean purposely so. And it's uh, so good. And it makes me love the song Putting on the Ritz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your number two, Justin Goldsmith. My number two, nineteen seventy eight, Dawn of the Dead. Hey. It's like Hey. A, hey. <laughs> like I said earlier, it's felt it felt when I saw it the first time like it might have been like one of the first modern horror movies and it still it doesn't feel old when you watch it aside from like the coloring yeah he definitely great movie. Romero had more money and again you're right this is at the height the peak I guess maybe that was the 80s but the mall started in the 50 50s the malls kind of took off yeah and the 70s malls were huge man yeah and people maybe listening don't know what malls are but there used to be all <laughs> these interconnected <laughs> shops seriously that the 50s show the rise of it and now we're seeing the demise. The mall's on its way out, guys. Yeah. The mall's gone. And, and I didn't mention it earlier, but it's got one of my favorite music pieces from the 70s also. Uh, this The song that plays during the credits. Um, zombie, I think is the name yeah, of it. it's just called Zombie. Because in, in, in Europe, it was released as Zombie. <laughs> yeah, Zombie. Yeah. With, a, a mo- with the soundtrack, and there's the poster right there. Yeah. The soundtrack mm. for the, the uh, Italian or European version has a lot more of the Goblin music in it. And mm. it's so much more like, just scary and eerie doom, because doom, of it. Doom, doom. 
And Dude. that. Dude. But that's because yeah. the relationship between the producer. You said who's it produced by? It was produced by Argento. Okay, who was yeah. an Italian Argento filmmaker? Argento came, uh, came up to Romero and said, "I want you to make another zombie movie." And Romero was like, "I don't really want to do that." But he had friends who owned them all somewhere. I think in Minnesota or something. Something. Like and that. he he was up there. and He's like, you know, if something like this really happened, you could live here for a while. And it gave him the idea. Yeah. And Argento put him up in Italy. For like two months, he like lived in Rome and wrote this movie. Went in Rome, and then they made it. And he the the deal was Romero got the American cut, Argento got the European cut, and I think the European cut is the superior film. It's way more creepy, is it, but the the American cut's way more humorous. Is it Italian audio? No, way, no, it's it's still American. But back then, they didn't really like Argento didn't care. Like, and in Argento films, there would be people that would like spoke Italian. Or spoke French, or spoke English. It didn't matter because it was dubbed for whatever was needed. At so the, the so his version is in English too. Yes. Oh, yeah. Cool. It's great. I'm watch it. They people, just dubbed everything. Most people don't know that's the same mall they did Mall Rats at. Is it? It's not. No, it's no. not. <laughs> Ghost was like real. <laughs> I'd have no reason to think you would lie about that. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of malls, my number two. It has nothing to do with malls. I hate you so much. But <laughs> if, if sharks went to malls, <laughs> what? My number two is Jaws. We talked about it being the big, uh, quintessential first big summer blockbuster. And Jaws, uh, it was it really did scare me. I didn't want to use the toilet. Afraid, I know I was a child. <laughs> the shark was going to come out of the toilet and bite me on the ass. So I shit in a bucket. No, that that part I don't recall where I shit. But <laughs> but Jaws scared the shit out of me. I did see the second one, and we were talking about theaters and people going. The '70s still the driving was still huge. Yeah. So seeing, can you imagine seeing Jaws? From your car on the biggest screen. Wow. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> Jaws is my number two. Such a great film. Such a great cast. Talk about Richard Dre- Dreyfus. Dreyfus. <laughs> Richard Dreyfus. Dreyfus. <laughs> so Jaws my number two. Now and I'm dying Roy to hear. Roy Scheider. Don't yeah. Forget him. Yeah. Who was also? We need a bigger sequel. boat. Oh, and dude, hmm. dude. Air, air, uh, the guy that the captain guy. What's his name? Great. Oh Bernard Robert George Robert Shaw. Shaw. Robert Shaw. Robert Shaw. Who's the who's I'm George the Bernard Shaw? <laughs> he no, he died. <laughs> He died uh, like a couple years in like seventy eight. Yeah, two years after yeah. that. Yeah, he's got that great story in there. That yeah, that was the one of the best parts. The all... when they talk about being in the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that story because that took it from like yeah. good old George know. Bernard Shaw. <laughs> <laughs> Jaws, great film. I'm dying to hear the number one. I mean, we've circled around now the of the the water tank. I'm trying to make a Jaws thing here. Circled around your salt water yes. toilet. Yeah, <laughs> uh, no. that was the other thing too. We had salt water toilets. That's <laughs> So they did live in Michigan. Yeah, there's Where no salt water stay? up there. <laughs> the Great the, Lakes are what's fresh in the water, water up there in Flint. <laughs> That's lead. I'm dying to hear number one, Timothy. But let's run down your other top five. Your number five was Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee. Your number four was Godfather. Your number three was Taxi Driver. <laughs> it looks like I wrote tie drawer. <laughs> <laughs> and your number two was Chinatown. What is your number one? I'm I'm eager to hear your number one, sir. So contrary to belief that I mean, there's so many blockbuster films and uh, all all the different films that happen to be pop culture um, phenomenons. I chose One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and it came out in 1975. Greatest, um, based on one of the greatest great, books of all time. Correct. Um, I'm surprised it didn't get brought up earlier. Jack Nicholson as McMurphy. Uh, I mean, it it definitely shown. His uh his appeal, and and what he can be as an actor, that potential there, and and that that's what made it so great. Robbie, I'm dying to hear your number one Uno first. <laughs> I think first was a word. Your number five was Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Your number four was Alien. Your number three was Godfather. Your number two was Young Frankenstein. What's your number one, sir? Well, I've talked about it a lot tonight. My number one is Dario Argento Suspiria. From 1977. Amazing. I just, I love that movie so much. It is, watch it if you haven't, and no matter what you think about it the first time, watch it two more times. Like, that movie is so good. Dario Argento had a process back in the day when he would, he had terrible dreams. He had a lot of mental problems. He, he does have a lot of mental problems. He's still alive, and he still has these problems. He's, they've gotten worse, actually, uh, as long, as, as well as his films. But anyway, um, Suspiria is so dreamlike, and the reason why it's so dreamlike is because he would wake up and have these nightmares and he would write them all down. He kept a dream journal and he would piece some of his movies together from his dream journals. And Suspiria is pretty much a very loose story 
but it is centered around scene after scene after scene are bits of his dream. And it is so terrifying. It's so scary. And it's scary and terrifying because of the way it's designed, because of the way it looks, because of the way it sounds. It's, it's so good. It's not one of those movies where the sto- Argento does not give a F about story. It's all about the feel of the movie. And Suspiria is one of the scariest movies ever. It just makes you feel a certain way, in my opinion. I love that film. It's beautiful. Excellent. Good choice. Great film. I have seen the film. You, I watched the film with you, in fact. You're like, you got to see this. And I'm like, uh, I was a little apprehensive. But visually, it's a treat. And musically, it's, it's beautiful. And it's again, if you haven't seen it, you listen to the show, do yourself a favor and check it out. You'll be, you'll be happy you did. And uh, I want to get to your number one, Justin Goldsmith. But first, let's do a rundown of your other top five. Your number four was Star Trek, the motion picture. Number four was Willy Wonka. Willy Wonka. <laughs> Willy Wacker. You said number four twice. <laughs> wacky, wacky, inflatable <laughs> tubes. Numbers no, is leave hard. it in. Just do it. <laughs> number five is Star Trek. Number four was Willy Wonka and the Chelly Factory. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> let's, let's do it. No, and number Please, three is. Leave it. <laughs> number three. <laughs> number three was Star Wars. Number two was <laughs> The Talking Dead. What is this? I can't, <laughs> I can't read my own writing. Oh, Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> I'm curious to hear your number one. My, <laughs> my handwriting my handwriting is kind of sloppy, so I had trouble uh, with this. Man. <laughs> <laughs> my number one favorite 70s movie. Uh, I, I kind of felt bad at first for picking it because of, of uh, some of the other conversation pieces we've had earlier in the show, but I don't feel bad about it because it's on my top 10 favorite films anyway. My number one favorite 70s movie is Jaws. And you had it on your number two just now, and I had to stop talking because <laughs> like, I was about to go into everything. That I mean, that, that scene, that's, w- that's when I stopped talking when we were talking about that. That scene in the boat when he's oh, telling he's the story. When he was in the military. With George and Bernard Shaw. <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah. With Robert Shaw. 200 men go in the water. It's just so much. That's a good impression. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but that's uh, actually one of the monologues I'm thinking about recording. You should. Um, yeah. But just, the, it's a really, really simple story. And it's, it's. I think that's why they were able to make it so cool. <laughs> it's the music. Da-da. You know what that is just from those two notes. Yes. You know there's a shark coming. Well, mm-hmm. it would help if you had two more notes. <laughs> so at least give me two more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's a great soundtrack. Actors, it's very subtle, but it actors, works so well. Yeah, the actors are great. Uh <laughs> Richard Dreyfus, uh, <laughs> Robert Shaw, <laughs> Chihuahua, and 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 I'm not even lying. I think I discovered, I figured this out on a podcast uh, a while back. The lead actor, uh, um, Roy Roy Roy, Roy Scheider, Scheider. Yeah. for that the, is Scheider, like not literally Scheider. until yeah, yeah. I think it was on a podcast. I figured it out during the podcast that there was no N in his name. <laughs> I always thought it was well, Schneider. Schneider is such a popular yeah. name. And Schneider's not less common. So yeah. that's what people think a lot of people think Rob Schneider was in Jaws. <laughs> He's got a bit part. <laughs> He's Rob, in the third one. Rob Schneider. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's one of it's on my top ten favorite movies. Period and uh, favorite seventies movie. Which. Brings the question, when are they going to do another Jaws film? Universal still owns the property. They have did multiple sequels and kind of tanked it. I'm very surprised speak. they haven't. Well, they were supposed to have one last year with the hologram shark. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Back to the Future? <laughs> From Universal Studios? My number one is going to be uh, the... Uh, oh, you need to do the recap. Yeah, give oh. us the recap, buddy. Number five was Young Frankenstein. My number four was Superman. My number three was Search for the Holy Grail. My number two... I almost gave you a three twice. My number two was Jaws. My number one is going to be Robbie's favorite film from the 70s. <laughs> well, it's not. Because he clearly <laughs> did say it. <laughs> it be Star Wars. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> no, it's Star Wars, man. Star Wars was... Uh, I've admitted that my favorite sci-fi film of all time was Tron. But the film that we wa- I watched the most as a kid that wasn't Tron, Star Wars, man. We d- and we didn't watch it on VHS. We had, this, we had something called... We rented it called the RCA... Uh, is this select division or something? It's the disc. The, we had laser got, disc. CED. Something. Did you have C- laser disc? No, this is pre laser disc. Capacitance like electric disc. Yes. Capacitance electronic disc. So we used to rent uh, 
Star Wars, and I, I just I just love the Star Wars films, and that was the obviously the beginning of Star Wars, it's the most highest grossing film of the seventies. I love Star Wars. I'm not again, it's not my favorite sci fi franchise, but I do love Star Wars. And uh, if you haven't seen Rogue One, by the way, it's phenomenal. You guys could go see it. Some people have considered it fantasy. Do you believe it would be? Yeah, a fantasy? it's it's more fantasy set in sci fi, just like Alien is a whore that's that's <laughs> set in space. You say that to your own mother like that <laughs> <laughs> damn it <laughs> okay um, alien. so it's definitely if it's definitely it is fantasy it's almost like D in space oh. so that's some spies there's no like robot dragons yeah, it's I, very mystical yeah the force and all that jazz oh, I love that. um but yeah so star wars is my favorite so that's our top five um when we put this on the uh, face page there you'll have to uh comment Tell us uh, if we missed something you think belongs in the top five. This is a hard one to do because there was such there's a lot of great films in the seventies. So narrowing down the top five was hard, but it was it was a fun show, great decade of films, and I'm excited for next episode. Actually, talk oh, about yeah. decades. When we do an eighties TV, eighties TV, eighties TV. It's so jump from film to in your home. I think television <laughs> in the nineteen eighties. <1980s. laughs> It's fantastic. I think it's great. And we're going to have the the PCP debut of Jeremy Day. Jeremy yep. Day is going to be on our show. A good old a friend of ours. It would be great to have him on the show. He's a very very uh, big pop culture guy. So it would be great to have him on the show. And I think uh, we're going to spend probably half the episode talking about A Small Wonder. <laughs> remember the show A Small Wonder? Not Mr. No, T. I don't. Who's the <laughs> shitty one with the robot girl? You guys remember that show? No, we're, not gonna be t- <laughs> we're not going to be talking about that show. Let me just start this over again. And we'll probably spend half of this <laughs> show talking about Elf. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Elf, right? Not Mr. T. <laughs> but we also got a new Rockin' with Rockin' Robbie coming up. That's right. We got Lies and Fish. Lies and Fish. Lies and Fish. I'll let you put that together in your head, but look for that exclusively on YouTube. But thank you guys for listening, and thank everybody for being here. Justin, thank you for being here, man. I appreciate everything. As no usual. problem. I'll come as often as I can. And you're going to be that's here very often. That's what she often. said. <laughs> Ooh, hey, now. Speaking of, and that's what she said, Timothy, <laughs> thanks for being here. You guys need to uh, work on your Jack Nicholson movies and your impressions. You oh, wow. Did you hear his George Bernard Shaw impression, though? <laughs> <laughs> Shoo. <What the> f- <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> Thank you guys for listening. This is Rock and Robbie signing out. Check us out next time, of course, for 80s TV. And I'm John Hammertheim Holshue. Thanks for joining. If you're listening to us on uh, iTunes, check out our site, www.popcultures. Bop- <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> www.popculturephilosophers.com. If you're on the website, we're also uh, available on iTunes and Android. And, of course, we have the awesome YouTube channel. Check us out there. There's so much more than podcasts. We do videos, uh, movie reviews. Uh, Robbie does awesome comic review re- weekly. Uh, also weekly. <laughs> weekly and weekly. <laughs> and uh, we appreciate you tuning in. Uh, join us next time. Same Jaws channel. Same Jaws time. Donut, donut, donut. 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 <laughs> Thank you.